Yep. All right, great. Well, I guess we'll get started, everyone. Hi, welcome to the um, the February meeting of the Verona Area Historical Society, our first virtual meeting. And I was just mentioning that a year ago, we had our most recent meeting, which we were in Quibi's Grove, I think a year and a week ago. And looking back at those pictures, it feels like it could have been 100 years ago, like how, how nice it was to get together uh, and, and be in one space and do a tour. What's, uh, I, I noticed that Arlen, when he did this presentation, he used an actual slide projector, if you remember. He projected it up on a screen. And here we are a year later, and we're doing it through Zoom, and we're using PowerPoint. So we have jumped a half century in technology at our historical society um, over this year. Here I am today prepping for this on my, my messy desk in my, uh, my room where I am presenting from. So we've, we've left technology. Uh, yeah, so today's, the point of today's meeting is we do once a year, do you see those little green marks? Okay, that's just me. We do, so we're our, uh, we're the Verona Area Historical Society. Hi everybody, if you're new, we're an all volunteer group dedicated to finding, sharing, and um, preserving Verona's history and culture. And we are a nonprofit, and normally we have monthly meetings in, in, the, in the before times, I like when people call it the before times, we had uh, monthly meetings. We will again in the after times, which will come sooner than later, I hope. Uh, but we, as part of being a nonprofit, we have an annual meeting where we elect officers, and we have to meet at least once. So I thought, since we're going to be meeting, let's do something fun, too, and have a little topic. I was a little too nervous to ask a speaker to come, because if I messed up all this stuff, I, I'd hate to waste someone else's time, but at least I'm only wasting my own time. <laughs> well, I guess yours, too, if this goes wrong, but bear with me. So thank you for joining our meeting, everyone. I bet when a lot of people saw this topic in the paper, they thought, wait, does Verona even have five historic sites left? I hear this a lot. Even just last week as I was picking up uh, Artifact, I heard, uh, the person that was giving to me said, yeah, we've lost all of our history in Verona. It's all gone. And this is kind of one of those perceptions I think folks have. And I would argue that we Verona still has our history. It's not kind of obvious and as well documented as maybe um, Evansville, where they have multiple historic districts, or uh, Baraboo's historic downtown. Ours is there, but it's kind of kind of like you got to look for it a little bit. It's, it's, it's covered by this maybe layer layer of modern life, but it's there if you know where to look. So here's a part you somewhere you may have walked by on South Main Street. And if you just went there today, you'd be like, okay, there's some cool houses and maybe an old looking building. But what you might not know is that uh, Brandy's Bloom's Flower Shop is in an old harness store back from the day when, when horses were roaming Main Street. Uh, you might not know that the Essential Salon is the house of, of the last house owned by one of our Civil War veteran POWs, William Matz. And you might not also realize that the Plumbing and Glass Building was one of our last blacksmith shops. Again, uh, in, in the horse and carriage days, horses were shooed right in front of this building. And actually, that last one I cheated a little bit, you would know because that was our first plaque we erected uh, back in August. So that one you'd know if you were walking down. But my point is, you know, you might, you're walking by these sites every day and you might not realize it. And one of our projects is to start labeling these, these areas. But today's, today's presentation is going to be kind of a deep dive into five of these places. And why a top five list? Why did I pick this? Because they are everywhere. Top five lists are all over the internet. Some are subjective, like, oh, here's a Valentine's Day themed one. Top five signs your ex still loves you. Some are more data driven, like uh, the, the top pistachio nut producing countries. By the way, USA, I didn't realize we had beat out Iran and Turkey in that respect. But top five lists are a huge thing right now online. They're fun. They're a way to kind of spark conversation. They can inform depending on how good they are. Um, but some of my big points are this list, this is kind of, bear with me, this is kind of like my list. It's subjective. Every top five list is subjective. This is kind of based on my own experience researching Verona history over the last five years or so. And I know some of you lived through some of the events I'm going to talk about. So let me know what I got wrong. If I say something wrong about something, you know, unmute, let me know later, because I might have made some mistakes. And if, if, by the way, if you're reading this, if you're watching this recording in the future, this list will probably change as we uncover more information about some of the sites around Rona. So this is kind of a snapshot as of right now. And a side note with Valentine's Day coming up, I didn't want to leave you all hanging as to what the top five signs your ex still loves you actually are. Uh, the number one sign is that they actively dislike you. Um, so... I guess I can't vouch for the accuracy of all these lists, but FYI, in case you, you, were, you were hanging there, I didn't want to leave you. Okay, so where is this information coming from? Here's some of our monthly meetings over the past just three years. We've had a lot of experts come in and talk about a lot of different aspects of Verona and world history. Some of the things I've kind of deep dived into personally, the old asylum poorhouse in Asylum Cemetery over by Gus's Diner, the Matt's house back in 2015 was a very hot topic around town. 
the New Century School uh, over the last couple of years, I um, filled out a questionnaire to eva have it evaluated for National Register of Historic Places, which got approved, and now that's being moved on. I'll talk about it a little bit later. Spoiler alert. And I've also gone pretty deep into the Davidson House in the Sugar River with Paul Reckner, an awesome archaeologist who I've learned a lot from. Uh, one of the things that we've definitely learned, though, is that I think one of our responsibilities as a historical society is to have the ability to investigate these sites and make an argument for if they are or not relevant. So with the Matt's House, you might remember in 2015, it was kind of on its way to becoming a parking lot. And a lot of us got together and learned about it, built a case, and thankfully, um, you know, the city was on the same page with us and they put a protection on the building and now it's this wonderful, thriving new business. Same with the New Century School. So being able to encapsulate historical relevance, I think is really important. And it's also super fun if you like puzzles and solving puzzles because the pieces are scattered everywhere and you gotta go looking for them. Okay, so what, and before you make a list, you have to, you have to, you have to define your parameters. So what makes something historic? If you want, put something in the comments about what you think makes something historic, and I will try to find them, because I'd love to hear your thoughts. I started by talking to children. I asked several kids on my street what, and the, the grades were from third to sixth grade. What, hey, what makes something historic? And you're going to hear some of their voices here. Mom and Dad, give me a nod if you can hear the clips when I, when I play them. So here's me interviewing the kids about what they think historic means. So what makes a thing historic? Rust, rustic, rusty stuff. Rusty stuff? Cool. Yeah. Um, well, it's historic if it's been around for a lot of years. Ooh, maybe some of us are it historic. it looks historic by getting maybe, um, maybe like a little dented and damaged. Well, great. Anything else in your mind makes something historic? It looking old. <laughs> and did you say your church is historic too? Yeah. We, told, we saw the original picture of it with people standing next to it, and it was black and white, and yeah. You always know know okay. something's old if it's black and white. So what else makes something historic? Ma it matters to history, like history wouldn't be the same. They're artifacts because it tells us about the world before like what we actually know today. Okay, little tear in my eye. I literally walked up to these kids and put the microphone and said, what makes it historic? There was no prep here. So I think the kids did a really good, really good job. I agree with a lot of this. Um, it's, it's fun to see it in their own words. My, my personal criteria for historically relevant, since I've had to make this case several times for some of our buildings are, um, I think something that represents an entire era that came and went, or, or someday will be gone. An example, here's a, one of our artifacts. It's a bell from the Gordon School used by teacher Bertha K. Spear in the 1800s. So they would, you know, ring this bell. This, this to me is a s symbolic of that whole era. The teachers, I'd have to ask my son who's at a class right now, but I don't think they're still ringing bells outside when they want to call kids in the morning or from recess. So that object you hold and you're, it kind of represents a generation. Another era I wish would pass really fast is here's a, a handmade mask um, from a resident of Verona who donated it for our COVID collection. And this is to represent what we're going through right now. So it represents an era. Another thing is, I think like a delta, a change over time. If a, if, an, if a place represents that, this artifact is um, when the Gordon School was created, it was an elementary level school. It eventually was sold, became a house. The homeowner put up this wallpaper with schools on it to kind of commemorate its history. Then the building got demolished in 2017-ish, 2018-ish. So this artifact, this ripped piece of wallpaper, to me symbolizes that change over time. Schoolhouse, house, demolished in a way that you just don't get from a photograph. You can hold this. Also, too, I'll say to round it out, if, an, if, an, if a site represents a specific important event or person, so important being subjective, it's all we as a society decide what's important, but if this represents it. An example is this golden shovel, which I snagged from the uh, groundbreaking of the new high school uh, two or three years ago. That is a historic object the moment it was used. And I would say, I don't think old is required. I think that shovel was historic the moment it was used during that ceremony. But old helps because you don't realize these right away usually, like especially one and two. An older object, in, in addition to just being awesome, a nice old object, it really gives you perspective. So anywho, that's my kind of um, personal criteria. So let's hop on in. Everybody buckle up in your DeLorean. And we are going to take off. I didn't have time to add Huey Lewis in the news here, if you don't get that reference. That's okay. But um, we're going to dive in now. And I ordered the sites from oldest to newest, roughly, based on when they 
they were relevant to Rona. And it was so hard picking just five, I wasn't going to try to rank those five. That was going to be fraught with peril. So come with me while we go back to our first site. Now, our first site today is a nod to Verona's original occupants, the Native Americans. And obviously we all know that Native Americans were here before the U.S. settlers. But one thing that kind of really took me by surprise is imagine, here's a hundred pennies stacked up. Imagine these pennies represent all of the years of human history in Verona. So all of the years a human has occupied Verona. How many pennies do you think would be the Native Americans versus U.S. settlers? Think about that in your head for a second. And maybe you're thinking, um, I don't know, maybe it's a 50-50 split. You know, they were here, we were here. Maybe you're thinking it was a 25-75. Well, thanks to what I've learned from awesome local archaeologist Paul Reckner, it's shockingly different. It is... One and a half percent of the human occupancy of Verona has been by the U.S. settlers. It was about 12,000 years to about 180. So we are very, very new residents of this area. And I, I never would have thought that it would be that kind of lopsided. Um, you know, archaeologists have, have, have placed early arrival of Native Americans to around 12,000 years. And also I say, you know, I use Native American, but it, it's not one huge monolithic time period and group. Archaeologists like Paul break it down into little little sub areas or, or eras, if you will, based on things like changes in their hunting technology, household technology like pottery, behavior where they the, the Paleo Indians were moving around a lot. Later on, there was our, 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 uh, agriculture, they were staying put. So there's actually these kind of three different major periods even. So a lot of human history before our pioneers. It's really opened my eyes to the fact that Verona didn't really start in the 1800s, it was just the next chapter. And again, thanks to Paul Reckner for teaching me and others about all this. But the, the, as far as sites and artifacts, the woodland era Native Americans left us some gifts. And you might know, if you're from this area and you pay attention that, Wisconsin and Northern Illinois is home to the, it's the capital of effigy mounds in the entire world. It's unprecedented anywhere else in the world. An effigy mound is a, a prehistoric mound, almost always containing a burial, uh, created in some kind of purposeful shape likely for religious or ceremonial purposes. And there were thousands of these in, in southern Wisconsin and northern Illinois before um, the U.S. settlement showed up. And almost all, I mean almost all, most, the lion's share have been lost to plowing agriculture in an early lack of respect. These awesome things were actually seen as nuisances. I mean, if you're plowing a field to feed your family and you got to go over this bump, you, it's not something you totally value at the time. Obviously now we value them very, very much. So how does this tie into Verona? Our first site... Here's Verona, and I put the stoplight there, my little Microsoft Paint stoplight I made to show you where the center of town is. The, for, for the first site, we're going to talk about the, the early U.S. settlement. So in about 1837, 1840, the first U.S. settlers came in a wagon from Cross Plains, and they headed south down the Epic Territory. And they came across something interesting. They came across nine conical mounds. So these are just basically mounds of dirt that are round. And one effigy mound that they thought was in the shape of a mammoth. I found out later from an expert it was probably a bear. But as they traveled down across what's now the Epic property, they made note of this. And here's a quote from 1877 about what they, they found. So here are, the, here are a couple of brothers, some Scotsmen who ended up being our first settlers. They came to 10 mounds, nine of which were circular, while one had the form of a mammoth, well, actually probably a bear. And they agreed to call this beautiful spot Nine Mound Prairie and, head, and then headed further south. This is where Nine Mound Road got its name from. Now, these, uh, th these nine mounds showed up on several of our plat maps. Here's, uh, I think, 1861 18 on the left, 1873 on the right. So they're a pretty prominent feature. Unfortunately, over time, they all went the way of most mounds in southern Wisconsin. They were plowed over, and they vanished from, from being actually visible. But I will say site one to me is the former nine mounds and the former effigy mound by Epic's land, because this is our connection to that, that massive era of human habitation before the U.S. settlers showed up. It's on the Epic property. Here's a picture of it. It's not super public exactly where it is, but Epic does have it protected, and they are regrowing pr original prairie native grasses on it to kind of bring it back to what it was pre-settlement. So we don't have to worry about this site. It's protected. You can't I mean, that's an actual picture of it. You can't really see anything at this point because it's been too plowed over. And for a long time, it, people wondered if it really existed. In, in, in 2010, if you remember local archaeologists and our former mayor, Phil Salkin, read, led a group that looked for these mounds and found five of them. And that's how Epic knew where to, to mark them off because five of them, I assume they used some kind of ground scanning equipment or something of that nature. 
But that's a really important site as far as I think Verona history goes. Now I'm going to cheat a bit. I said this was site one, but it's my list. I can do what I want. I actually have a site one and a half. I'm going to jam in here, which is if you head south down 69 out of Verona and you go to what's now called the Sugar River Wildlife Area that was recently acquired by the county, you will find, this is my site one and a half, it's a still present conical mound. And this is the property owned by the county. This little area here, there's a little house there in a parking lot and you can get on the Sugar River. That's all public land. You can go walk this today if you want, if you have your, uh, your uh, parka on, of course. Here's a little bit of a zoom in. Oak Grove Road comes down and there's parking there. But right down here is this wonderful old house from the 1860s that we call the Davidson House because it was from one of our original settlers. Now, um, behind this, this house on the northeast side is an actual verified Indian mound. And we know that because in the 1930s, a famous Wisconsin archaeologist studied it. And studying back then, unfortunately, meant you had to dig into it to see what was in there. They didn't have ground penetrating radar. But we know this was a burial mound. It's still visible. There's a huge tree growing out of it. But I nominate this as my first one and a half site because it's one of the few places you can go and put your hand on something from our original human inhabitants, which to me is just magical. And you can go and see this. And I would encourage you all to do it when it's a little bit warmer. There was also an effigy mound here in the 1930s that archeologists, his group studied this area and they found the remains of a panther effigy, which is now completely lost in the last um, 90 years or so. So if you have a chance, I try to put the map here. If, if you all wanna go and visit these places, I would, I would nominate these, this site and the epic site as site number one, most relevant to Verona history. Okay, so let me just check here. I see some comments lighting up. Um, oh, <laughs> someone mentioned there. That's awesome. That your car is historic. I guess you're probably talking about the dented and the looking old. You're right. I, okay, so by that definition. Thank you. That's awesome. Okay, so I'm going to move on to site two now. And for that, I want to start with a question. If you were starting a town in the 1800s in southern Wisconsin, what would you build first? So here is one of our pioneer families. This is uh, one of the Stewart family. He's actually on the farm that became the Epic Farm. Those trees in that valley are still there in the background. This photo's from Don Stewart. What would you build first? You got a lot of choices. A blacksmith shop, church, saloon. But what kind of thing would you really think is important? And that leads us to site number two. And for site number two, we're going to head south from the main intersection down Main Street to right about where Badger Mill Creek crosses underneath the highway. And I just gave you a little bit of a hint as to what it is. So it is, um, of course, the, the, the original Badger Mill, which the creek got its name after. And I have this timeline here. Now that we're a little bit closer than 11,000 years, I can zoom in. So in uh, 19, or 1833, about a year after the gov US government acquired this land, it was all plotted out into Town 6 North, Range 8 East. Verona's a little easier to say, so I'm glad we changed that name. The first US settlement came around 1840-ish. I was talking about them earlier. By 1842, we had 22 residents in this area. So still pretty small, especially by today's standards. 1844, the Badger Mill is built. So this is really early. I mean, the first U.S. settlers lived in a hole um, when they came here. And now we've gone from that to a fully functioning mill in just four years. It's very rapid, rapid uh, change in time. A little bit about the Badger Mill, built in 1844 by William Wheeler and George Vroman. Um, William Wheeler's daughter, Olive, was the first uh, U.S. settler girl born in Verona, what would become Verona. George Roman, you might recognize from Fitchburg, very important in Fitchburg history. There's a Roman road where he and his family settled. It was purchased by Samuel Taylor short after, within a couple of years. Samuel Taylor came from England, was a trader. He made trips back and forth from North America to England before settling down here. And um, he also brought or purchased our first portable threshing machine. That's kind of one of his little historical footnotes. The, the creek, here is the, a picture of the creek. Let me see if I can play my video here real quick. Because if you have not explored the Badger Mill Creek, uh, there's, uh, there's private land down there, but I think if you walk in the creek, I think you're covered. Uh, check with your lawyer first, of course. But I am going to play a quick video here. And you might not hear the sound, but this is a couple years ago. This is me and my kids down by the creek. Look at this. You can see the water bubbling up from the ground. This just fresh, cold water. And this is just from two or three years ago. So if you walk on the creek, you're going to find this. And this feeds into the creek which now is also fed by returned water from the Madison um, water treatment plant down, downtown. So an amazing place you can imagine for Native Americans, also for early settlers to have this fresh water. Also, you have um, a, a great place to build a mill. 
Here's a couple old quotes from the mill. On the completion, there was a grand ball was given. And for years and years, farmers came from miles around. So talk about things that put Vern on the map. This mill was one of those early things. And remember this name, Samuel Taylor? One of the, according to one of the accounts, the first real settlement in Verona was down by the mill. So down here, here's our main intersection up there by the Matt's house. Here's where Badger Mill is. People actually called this Taylorville uh, at one point, and eventually, you know, we became Verona. And you can see on this 1861 map, we've got the Badger Mill right there. Our post office was down there. We had a small settlement. We had a store, a place where people would come and trade. So a really important place that's I mean, almost entirely white from the map today, which kind of gives me chills when I think about that. By 1873 here, the map on the right, this is a very detailed plat map. You can see there's the mill, some of those houses, a store, but the post office has moved north now. Things are starting to kind of aggregate around where we know the downtown today. And, and about nine years later, actually seven to eight years later, the railroad would come through up here, and that pretty much did it for Taylorville. Everything moved up to where the railroad was. But this is a pretty cool spot in Verona history. And a little bit about the mill in Taylorville, we, we had the store post office I mentioned. There were a lot of community function happened down in this mill. That was the, one of our first organizations to, to um, or, or meetings to organize a church. This is that great quote I teased you with in my email yesterday. Uh, another memory recalled is a baptism that took place in the Badger Mill Creek. The weather was so cold the ice had to be broken before the baptismal service. So, so imagine going out there today and cracking ice. After the baptism, the children were taken to the home of Mr. and Mrs. Robinson, who um, lived right by the mill and dressed by the stove. So an early, you know, religious ceremony. And also, another, this Robinson family comes up again. They were um, known for having religious services in their house. So this is before we had a church in that area. So we're talking really early, and you can see the importance of this um, area to early Verona. I found, I did a newspaper search, and I found this old 1850 advertisement in the Wisconsin Express for, for um, Samuel Taylor's flour. Looks like it was... Uh, about 12 cents for 100 pounds. I haven't bought flour in a while. Has that gone up? I don't know. I, I think my wife's upstairs. I think I have not purchased flour in some I can't remember, but I'm a little cheaper back then. Great flour. He's selling it here in 1850 right out of Rona. So you can kind of see. Now, here's the question. This is one of those ones that kind of haunts me. Where the heck was this mill? Where the heck was it? I mean, exactly. If you're like me, you want to go stand on this place right now. You know, seeing these pictures is cool, but I want to see it. Okay, so um, plat maps were, as I've learned from Paul Reckner, were mostly for the purpose of showing property boundaries. Putting structures on them was kind of at the discretion of the author of the map, and at some times the locations were sketchy. What's cool is this 1873 plat map, this person was very detailed compared to the other ones. They put lots of points of interest on there. They were very detailed in their little, their little um, drawings. And in here you can see this person has put the mill on the west side of, this is Highway M today, and the, the south side of Badger Mill. And our earliest photograph of Verona from the sky is 1937. And this, if you look, these two things are pretty darn similar in their shape, which here's where the water crosses, and then here's where the mill would be, where this red dot is. So this gets us started. If this is to be trusted, which it's pretty detailed, uh, Badger Mill would be somewhere in this area. Now, here's the bummer. You might recognize if you've driven south out of town, you don't do this crazy gooseneck. Heck, you'd probably fly off the, on the, the road on a day like this. The road was changed. In 1939, I found this also through a newspaper search, they straightened out the road. And they talked about how this is where the mill was, the gooseneck will be straight across the new concrete bridge. They built a new bridge, they moved the river a bit, and they straightened the road. That's a big bummer. <laughs> because here's where it was, here's the road today, and I'm gonna go back and forth. You can see before the change, today. About where that mill would have been is probably either right where the road is now or just off to the side. So it's been messed with quite a lot, which is why when Art and I went down there a few years ago and we got all covered in mud and water and we, we crawled around looking for, uh, well, I got covered in mud. I didn't make Art go in the, in the creek. We went looking for any evidence of this that our novice eyes could find. There's no shortage of cool rocks, asphalt pieces, you can imagine a place that's been through this much change. We didn't find anything where you looked at it and said, hey, that's a foundation. Oh my gosh, it's a mill wheel. Although I did find this pretty cool, huge rock. The only really interesting thing that I found was this chunk in the bottom right, which is clearly um, mortar, old mortar holding rocks together. I saved a piece of this, it's, it's in our collections. Someday we'll have that mortar analyzed to see maybe when it dates from. But nothing down there where you could be like, this is where the mill was. How far are we from someone who knew where the mill was? This is one of those questions that when you go looking for something, how recently did you miss something? I don't know if anyone on the phone knew 
Joseph Henderson. Laura, did you know? I can see you. You can just nod your head. Did you know Joe Henderson? I thought, no, didn't. Okay, some folks on this call might have known him. Longtime resident. He was interviewed in 1978. And when I was putting this cassette onto digital, my ears perked up at one point. So I'm going to play this for you. And I also have some words here. So listen up to this 1978 interview with Joseph. On whose farm or who owns the land right now that Badger Mill was on? We can't really pinpoint exactly, exactly where, where Badger, Badger Mill was. was. Well, now you were going, you must have been going down to school now. Well, I Badger know Mill. where Badger Mill is. Ooh. Yeah. Would there be any foundation stones left? Do you know? There is. Oh, no I church. haven't been out there for a long time. But uh, it's right up that road where that uh, that German Lutheran church is. You mean St. James Lutheran? Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. it's right straight down there. But they've changed the, uh, the, uh, the whole uh, thing of it there with the roads and things so that it doesn't seem the same place at all. But it's still there. Ooh. And it was down there. Now, Do you suppose someday if we had time that we might go looking for that this summer? Well, any time you want to do okay. anything, I got all the all right. time there is. Sometime this summer, we'll just go looking for yeah. that and see you. I love that. I love that last quote. Um, Joe's got a couple little magic moments like that peppered through the interview. But this part, my ears perked up and then my heart just broke because Joe knew where this was. He might have been one of the last people. And the, the his nephew is the male voice interviewing him and he's passed on. And the female voice we've asked doesn't remember this interview. So we're not sure if they actually went down and found it. But this is how close we were to knowing where that mill was. But what's cool is he says it's still there even after the road was moved. So maybe it was in one of the places that uh, is between the old and the new. Um, so that is site two, the site of the Badger Mill, which put Verona on the map early. I'm going to just check the chat here. Um, oh, someone asked the creek. Oh, someone just said they were, the creek was bubbling when they ran by it. Good. The creek's still bubbling. Go check it out. And oh, I, I do buy my wife flowers at Brandy Shop in the former Harness. Uh, is that a hint for tomorrow? That was my wife who said that. Was that a hint? Because I haven't been by Brandy's this week, if you get my drift. But anyway, site three. We've moved on to site three in, in, uh, in Verona's historic sites. This one's related to schooling in Verona. Let me click here. Bink. Now, we all know today that there's this single unified Verona area school district, which covers all of Verona and then some. And children, you know, feed into the public system and they kind of go the path where it lays out, which has changed a lot in the, couple of year, in the last couple of years. Those of you who lived here before the 1960s, which I know is a lot of faces I, I, I recognize, which by the way, correct me if I get any of this wrong, but you know this was not always the case. Verona used to have about a dozen smaller school districts. And each one had its own school board, its own rules, bylaws, its own buildings. They operated independently. Eventually, they all fed into one unified Verona High School district starting early 1900s. We had our first high school in 1899, so I assume somewhere around there. But all of these were independent. And um, let's see, moving on to the next one. These were your typical one-room, maybe two-room rural schools that, that if, if you're younger, like, younger than this era, like me, you've, only, you've read about and just seem really, really interesting. First through eighth grades. And in addition to teaching, the one teacher would tend to the cleaning of the building, maybe keep the fire going, and had a large array of responsibilities. But these schools, and please chime in if, if, if you can speak to this personally, these were community centers. They weren't just school buildings. There was a lot of rural pride, uh, maybe even versus the snooty downtowners, from what I've read in some of the um, articles <laughs> from that era. There were mother's clubs. There were, and, and a lot of people feel that they had better... Um, better teaching experiences. I came across an article where someone compared test scores from the rural schools to the Verona grade school, and, and in certain areas, the rural schools were higher, so they were using it as an argument to try to keep those around. They were closer to the kids' homes, and I just can't stress how, how big of a community aspect these schools had. But eventually, they were unified into one school district. And one reason was economics. It's just a lot more efficient to have one centralized place with one science room, one gym, one music room, than to have a dozen different districts uh, array, or, or maintaining all those things. Here is, speaking of opposition, in the 40s, when people started talking about consolidation, this was in our library files, or in the library files, people, and we saw this in the last couple of years, when you mess with people's kids, they get angry. And this was no different. People, especially in the rural areas, were very strongly 
in the opinion of not wanting consolidation. There was a lot of very, very strong feelings. Fascist movement. The politicians can't take away our rights. This is in the 40s, and they're talking about rural schools here. So people felt really passionate. But of course, it did happen. We consolidated around 1964. The, um, the rural schools, nearly all of them, except for, I think, uh, Valley View, Maple Grove, closed. And the schools came together in two shared buildings downtown. The unused rural schools were auctioned off. And um, here are some pictures of them then and them today. Most of them, thankfully, are still around. Some became houses, some did get torn down. Some became houses and then got torn down, which is sad. Uh, you can see the Gordon School I mentioned earlier in the bottom right. But one of them definitely did not do either of those things. And that brings us to site number three, which is the White Schoolhouse. And the White Schoolhouse is, going back to our timeline, came around about 1850. Here's an old picture of it. The oldest pictures sure look like the modern building. I don't have a total chronology going back to 1815 to prove it's the same structure that was built then. Um, but it is located on the, the Goodman Jewish Community Campus, uh, way up by White Crossing and PD. And what's cool about this is it was purchased by Eldon Himsel, who was a descendant of the original White family for whom the school was named after and donated the land. It closed its doors in 1965, and it sat there. Ownership changed. Today, the Goodman Jewish Center owns the land that it's on and the building. This picture was taken just a few years ago. And if you look at the old late 1800s, early 1900s picture, it's kind of kind of still the same. It hasn't been converted. There's no plumbing. There wasn't a garage added. It, thankfully, it's not been destroyed or, met, or, or, or largely altered. Here is a, a little bit of a, a history on it, the early white school. Before they had the school, Mary Etta White taught kids in her living room. So you can see, this is 1850, this is early Verona. And when they finally built the building, the teachers received $1.25 a month. Pat, you were a teacher. I can see you, I'm picking on you. Nod your head if you got paid more than $1.25 a month. Shake your head if you didn't. Oh, okay, good, good. So that has changed. I just love seeing these old numbers. And also, did you ever have to live in the houses of your students? Probably not, no, okay. Yeah, that was a thing back then. The teacher would be housed for a month in, in a different student's homes, which is, or a week, sorry, for a week. Little timeline, 1850, 1965, sold. Uh, and here are some of the last pictures taken when it was still a school. And um, you can see, look at the picture, and then this picture to the right, it, it's still got the white school sign up there. It looks so much like it. So as far as an old object being historically relevant because it's still in its kind of original condition, when this was a school, it still looks like that, which is, which is awesome. Here are some more modern pictures around the building that I took. You can see the old stone foundation. You can still see the, the little um, little guy sticking out of the roof where the, the bell probably was at some point. And the good news about this, this school is the Goodman Jewish uh, Center, I spoke with their director this spring. They have no plans to destroy the school, move it, mess with it at all. They're, they think it's cool and they're just kinda, they cut the grass around it, which is awesome. I think we're gonna, as a historical society, we have to get a little more involved with this in the future, maybe help with some maintenance. I think at some point, this is going to be, oh man, if this could be restored and have school kids visiting this like they do in Middleton, wouldn't that be just amazing? But because it represents an era lost, it's in such great condition, and heck, it's old and a little dented, I'm going to say this is my site number three. Let me check for comments. I will, um, I'll check for comments after each little piece there. Okay, so if you have questions or comments, feel free to hit the little chat button. But we are going to move on to site four. Now... If you've been to some of our meetings, you, you kind of knew this one was coming. <laughs> you know what this one is, site four. We're gonna go back to the timeline again. Here's Badger Mill, uh, 1850 White Schoolhouse. 1845, the Matz family comes to Verona. Or sorry, 1844. 1845, they purchase the East House, what becomes our downtown. And then around 1848-ish, the Matz house, the brick building, still there today, was built. I've had experts from the State Historical Society go through there and they look at it and they go, this looks like a early 1860s building. This would have been the local histories going back to, all, you know, to Alice Kuntzman's book in 1947, all peg 1848 is the date. So I always just say ish. There was, Josiah did not pull a, a, a building permit when he built this. He did not <laughs> go down and you know have an inspector come through. So we don't really have a written record of exactly when this house was built, but it is awesome, it is old, and it's my site number four. And I always like to point out that when they made this, this, this trip from, from Pennsylvania, uh, Lydia was four months pregnant with their next child, which is, think of someone taking a three month wagon ride. Uh, that's just so amazing, the, the kind of pioneer spirit of some of these folks. 
Here is the land approximately that the Matz family purchased. You can see it's got downtown all the way up to the cemetery. There was actually a, a, some relatives who came around the same time. Josiah and Lydia built the Matz house. Lydia's brother, Joseph Flick, purchased the west, hand of, of, west half of downtown from the US government. And then her brother, Deborah Flick, Mary, or sorry, her sister Deborah Flick married John Myers, and their son was Jesse Myers, the Civil War veteran I talk about sometimes. And if anyone remembers this house, which was across the street from the Matt's house until the early 2000s, this was kind of a carbon copy made because Deborah liked Lydia's house so much that um, John built another one across the street and rotated a little bit, and that was a, a pretty awesome old brick house. And we have a brick of that in our, in our collections. Uh, sadly, it is no longer around. So a little bit of a family relationship. Here's our oldest history, or our oldest historic picture of the Matt's house. And you know, you've probably heard me talk about it, but I can't, I can't stress enough the, the contributions of the early of the early Matt's family. They provided land for our First Baptist Church, our railroad, railroad, our town cemetery. They ran the post office out of this house for a while, and they were involved in all kinds of civic affairs. The Matt's name comes up over and over if you look at old church ledgers. Uh, community documents. They were very involved. Their son, William, I mentioned earlier, who lived in the house that the Essential Salon is in, uh, that was his final house. He was one of our 106 soldiers who served in the Civil War. We had we lost 12, 24 wounded, and him and his cousin Jesse Myers were two of our POWs, and he is buried in the uh, Verna Cemetery. The daughter, a little side note, Emma, was uh, his sister. She married the town doctor, uh, Dr. Jane, who um, would attend to patients out at the poorhouse. And um, she sadly passed away very young in 1883, within a week of Josiah, both of typhoid pneumonia. So a very sad week for that family back then. Uh, she's buried in the Madison Cemetery over on Speedway. Now the, the Matt's house has been through many different lives, perhaps more than a cat, I would count. I think we're beyond nine lives at this point. It has been all the things I mentioned. It's been a flower shop. It was a car dealership um, for um, Laura's relatives. At one point, it was a free building if you can move it. This is one of the saddest pictures I've ever seen in 2014. This is before it, uh, you know, our effort to help the city decide. This is before the city even bought it. Um, so today it's been renovated in the last few years and it is a wonderful local book, bookstore called Kismet Books, which opened this, in this November. I know a lot of you were there. And one of our largest efforts as a historical society to date was to help the city see value in this building. And I think we're all very, very proud of that. And you can put your hand on the wall and you can feel what Josiah and his family built in 1848 and what it meant to all these different areas of Rona history. So spe very special place. I talk about the Matt's house a lot. I tried to think about stuff I don't really mention that I've learned. Here's a couple little Easter eggs. If you go in there and you're, you're, you're buying local books, this is something Troy Rost, who led the most recent renovation, discovered when he took apart one of the many layers of drop ceilings up in the top is this lead pipe you can see this in the front left side of the store and these were used for gas lighting at some point this building was retrofitted to have gas going through which sounds crazy dangerous but i guess that was a common thing at some point also this building had a a um stove in nearly every building and as you go through there you see these little squares and these old chimneys so look for those remnants when you go book shopping at kismet next it's really fun to look for those and so i'm going to round it out we're going to go back to the list for site five very tough to decide what sites to put in the top five and we're going to be just like my kids this week we're going to be back in school you'll remember a few minutes ago i mentioned the all the different rural school districts were all consolidated what happened in the mid 60s all this got mixed up and smushed, and where did all these kids end up? Well, they ended up downtown in these two buildings, the Verona Graded School from 1917-ish, and what was most recently known as Sugar Creek, built in 1956, at 420 Church Street. I'm going to focus in on the Graded School as my number five most relevant historic site. And I, um, I, it dates back to around 1917. There was a Graded School that existed before that. I've read an account that it was blown down in a windstorm, and then this brick building was built. This, we got a little three, maybe a little three pigs thing going on there. And um, later on, 1956, another elementary school was added just up the up the hill from it. They were eventually joined, I think, in the 70s. I chose the graded school because of its long service to our community uh, and to its its witness. It saw this collision of culture. It's hard to think of a uh, maybe maybe when the settlers came, obviously, but think of times in Verona where cultures just collided. It seems like this rural school consolidation was one of those big moments. 
so I picked this because this building witnessed it. Here is, this was found by uh, Mr. Uh, one of the, uh, I think it was Mr. Gunlock, one of the New Century teachers several years ago before the 100 year, and this is an original blueprint from 1917. What's crazy awesome about this is, here's a picture I took this fall. Look at that. Oh my goodness, it looks almost exactly the same. So talk about historical relevance. Uh, and, and by the way, some of that was took some advocacy. I know Denny Barris, when he was in the school board, when they replaced these windows around 2008, they were originally going to put just big sheets of glass, and he kind of argued to use these multiple pane view because it looked more like the historic ones. So thank you, Denny, for that. But amazing. You can see this little 1950s edition show up here in the front that I've learned a lot about from Mary Steister. But, I mean, that's, that's pretty amazing. Here are the 20, 2017 blueprints. If you've been in this building, you'll notice how similar it is to today's plans. There's some big changes. This gymnasium in the bottom is gone. It's classrooms. I, think, I know John Shera has told me about what it was like to play basketball in this little tiny gym with the, with the little roof. And, it, you know, in addition to there was the bottom, bottom right area here was where the addition went in the 1950s. Here is a 1923 Arthur Vinge photo of that gym we were just talking about. You can see this was a class in hygiene. You can see the basketball net here and all these pipes. I can only imagine what it was like to try to take a three-pointer and uh, look out for the light bulb. But this is a photograph of what the gym looked like, which is now gone. But most of the building is as it was from what we can tell. Here's another awesome old photo, 1937. Um, there's Alan Lillison in the front row. I got this from the Lillison family. I love these photos because the, the teachers would often write their name and the year on the board. Good thinking. We couldn't just right-click the file and hit properties to see where it was from. They actually put in there, you can see some other details like um, these these picture rails. Some of those are still there in this building. I think I was in this building for ninth, or in this room for ninth grade in the early 1990s when we moved kids off site because we were building the addition to the high school. I think a lot of us have connections to this room and to this building. This is from a, a couple years ago, I completed a, a long questionnaire to the Wisconsin Historical Society about if this building could qualify for the National Register. This is a map I drew with a lot of information from many different sources about the original structure, the addition, the other addition, maybe around 1977 that connected it to Sugar Creek. But this middle part here, I mean, this is a modern satellite photo, still, still there with some, some alterations there. That same application, not to show a big boring block of text, but here's some of the, the stuff we learned about the building. Uh, another little historical footnote, I found this in one article from the State Journal. I wasn't able to verify this myself, uh, but I'd love to someday, which is the New Century Charter School might have been, according to this article, was the first elementary level charter school in Wisconsin. And now there's several hundred. So that's pretty cool too, a little bit more recent piece of history that this building can lay stake to. And there it is, the New Century School, which now obviously has just moved with all the redistricting. Good news about this building, everyone. If you've been reading the Voter Press or coming to meetings with us, city, city council meetings sporadically, the developer who has purchased this property from the city to, to redevelop it, the city wonderfully saw value in this building too. And right from the start in our um, um, CDA, community development authority meetings, they made part of their request for this property a protection on this school building. And Alexander Company and Steve Brown Apartments have committed to going the next steps and listing this building on the National Register of Historic Places, our first property in Verona, which will be, we'll have a party then, it will be amazing. And as you see the plans, here's that building amongst, amongst all the new development. Here it is again, right there. They don't know what they're going to do with it yet. They're looking for community input. I've given them some ideas. If you have ideas, let them know. It's just going to be a wonderful fixture. And that is my site five. So that, let me check for comments here. Hey, someone mentioned that it was a fourth grade building when I was a kid. Yeah, that's really cool. It went through, it went through a lot of, I mean, it was in continuous use from what we can tell by the school for over a hundred years up until this year when it uh, transferred, or this last year when it transferred to the city. So that is my fifth site. I do want to kind of to kind of circle back. I learned making making this list. I learned a lot about prioritization, and the hardest thing about these lists, I think, is deciding what goes in place six to ten. One to five was hard enough, but I know each one of you probably has your own favorite historic sites, and I bet they're not exactly my top five. And it was really tough to bump some. If I did have to do a meeting called Verona's Top Six to Ten Historical Sites, which just doesn't have the same ring as a, as a top five list. Here are the ones that I really had a hard time 
moving to six through 10. We'll see if they're on your site too, or your site list. I'll call my next most important. I didn't mention the glacier, huge impact on Verona, on farming, on everything that came. I would have picked the site on Highway M by um, where, the inter where the overpass goes over by the water tower, because that's a glacial moraine you can stand on and you're standing on soil dump there 15 to 20,000 ish years ago. I would have picked the coming of the railroad downtown because a, a town in the 1800s, if you get a railroad, if you don't get a railroad, really is a fork, fork in the road for how your town develops and the railroad had a huge impact on Verona. The poor house and the asylum dominated the east side of our town for a long, long time. How often do you come across someone who had some connection? Me, just last week, uh, uh, someone was donating an artifact and they mentioned they used to, they were a nurse there. It's like you're constantly coming across people, even today, that have some connection. As we head south, there's the original site of where the Scottish settlers made their first encampment in 1840-ish. Uh, and also there's the Davidson House itself is pretty amazing. And, and all the, the digs, if, you're, if you want the traditional site definition, like historic site, there's plenty of them up and down Highway 69 that archaeologists like Paul have studied. He also, I, I, I think I get more excited about this than anyone, but he found a Clovis point, which is a, an artifact from that first era of, of Native Americans we saw at the bottom of my map. He found one in a field down there somewhere, and that's, to me, is just, I almost thought about making that, <laughs> that Clovis point one of our sites. So, yeah, thanks everyone for watching. I appreciate it. if you have. Does anyone, by the way, I would love, does anyone have a comment if you want to unmute yourself and add something? Did I, did I miss any other sites? Did, did I get anything wrong? Um, was my summary of the rural school consolidation accurate? Feel free to unmute and, and throw your thoughts in or put them in the, in the chat. I just want to know, is this going to be available any other time because I got distracted and I just tuned in. It sure will be, you bet. I've been recording this and I'm gonna put, um, once I, I fact checked myself and maybe put some annotations where I said something wrong like that Civil War year, this will be on our website. There's a little thing you can click that says uh, past events and I'll have it there so you can watch. And I would, I would oh, love it if you- Oh, nice. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for your interest. I would love it if you told other folks about it because I think one of our missions is to stoke this interest. You can walk by South Main Street a thousand times and think Verona's lost its history. But once you really start looking through that lens, you, you can appreciate it much more. Bill Keen asked a great question. The, the Indian mound by the gravel pit, it's on private land. I did think about that one and I think it might have been on Paul Reckner's list when I asked him for input. There's another Indian mound that shows up on the early plat maps, plat maps. It's down by the gravel pit on 69. It's on a fence line. The reason I didn't add it, Bill, is because I haven't seen it and I don't know much about it. But if, if you know the owner or anyone, I would love to go up there and look at it because that I've, I've heard so much about it and it sure seems like it's an actual Indian mound. So that's the only reason I left it off. Um, yeah, thanks, Nate. I, I, appreci I appreciate it. Yeah, other... By the way, I'm really curious, anyone who lived through the consolidation, just because we're having a meeting, it's fun. Anyone who lived through the consolidation, can you add your own thoughts? Because for me, it's all been stuff I've heard about, I've read about, I've learned from a lot of you about. But firsthand, I'll give you a moment here if anyone wants to chime in. I'm I very, very interested in this topic. Uh, it's just and, it's such um, a big, important thing. So did my dad. And, yeah. Uh, yet we really... Um, hated to see the breakup of our district. Okay. Wow. Yeah, that's what I've heard. And man, can you think of a time? So, Lori, you've lived in Verona. You've lived in Verona continuously since then. As far as like people across the community getting all worked up, can you think of a time when that was equaled or rivaled since then? Does anything stand out? Like no, it doesn't. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for chiming in. I love hearing from firsthand experience. And we did know the Hendersons. I don't know Joe, but I did know Lester and Marie were our close neighbors. And Lloyd Henderson, who was a brother of Jay, was one of my brother's closest friends. Oh, they nice. Nearby, and uh, Lloyd spent a lot of time at um, our house with my brother's playing ball. Was Jay the guy that was in the picture I yes, showed? And yes. was he related to Joe, the guy from my um, mill story? I think they might have been related. Not sure, though. I, I don't know Joe at all. Okay. I knew Forrest Henderson, but I don't know the relationship of Joe. Okay. 
I just thought it'd be funny if the same family showed up in two different sites. There was a question here. Um, can we purchase a copy of the school blueprint? The school blueprint that I showed um, is currently in the basement of, I think it's Potter Lawson Architect downtown. They may have a newer name. And, and I think Larry, the teacher, found it and they let him take those wonderful pictures of it that have been so important to its process since. I remember he said that they to scan them they would need some crazy huge scanner and the, the fee was going to be a couple hundred dollars that was years ago and if i'm getting this wrong i apologize but if you contact that architect firm and you ask them about that that would be your best bet i mean i just feel like when we get our when we organize our museum hopefully in the next five years i have us on a five-year plan or our display space it'd be cool to have a copy of that up on the wall but thank you for asking let me see oh here's something from mary Let's see, I was in the consolidation. We would have gone to Belleville, but not Verona. I think I did find some articles like this. I would like to see photos of some of the shower school. It was our family name. I did not go there for grade school, but went to Paola. I remember going there one time. My aunt Schaller was a teacher there. Yeah, Mary, I, I'll make a note. We do have some pictures of the of the shower school that I'm not sure if I showed in my, my school, but I will make a note to follow up with you and send you what we have. Great. What other questions? Ken Banky here. Can you hear me? Of course. Hey, Ken. Thanks for joining. Can you hear me? Yeah, I was just. I was just. I had added a comment that uh, it'd be great to see historical markers at all of the rural school sites. Fitchburg did this quite a few years ago. Yep. Yeah. That'd be a great thing to do since almost all of them still exist. Yeah. Excellent point. It's been kind of one of our talked about things once in a while. Yeah. Um, and a lot actually, of things on the list, I know. Yep, but no, yep. I'm glad you brought that up. That the one, the Maple Corner School, on um, on M and I forget the other road going by there. C uh, Fitchburg Road. Is I it Fitchburg Road? Their aluminum sign there is kind of what was an inspiration for the Matt's House sign making that big 2017 because it's oh, like, okay. oh look, you can just yeah. make it on aluminum and it doesn't rust and everything. So no thanks, Ken. Yeah. Do, you, do you have anything? So Ken. Um, I always want to say I'm not worthy anytime you come to our meetings because Ken wrote literally wrote the book on Verona history in 1972. And since you're here, Ken, what would how would your top five list differ? I'm curious if there's anything that oh, you no, would I think you did a great job. It's fantastic. Is there anything? Yeah, what's your favorite site? Oh, gosh. I don't know. And Ken's book, while you think, Ken, I'll mention Ken's book is downloadable from our website. If you go to books, you can click it and you can read it as a PDF. So definitely go read it there if you haven't or get it from the library. But is there anything that's your favorite, Ken, that you would put on your, on Ken Benke's top five list? Other than what you had? Yeah. I don't think so. But okay. I think I think the Nine Mounds really, I think you put it in a good context. That, oh, thanks. That really relates to, you know, 99% of the <laughs> history of the area's inhabitation. Yeah. So, I don't know. I think that it, that was worthy of being at the top. I really do. Oh, thanks. But, no, I, I think you pretty much nailed it. I think the Dane County uh, Poor House and Asylum need to rank maybe number six. I know, it was so tough. Such a, <laughs> such a big influence. So many people work there, so many people live there. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Ken. And no, I, I don't know. I think, I think you did a good job. Oh. I was just going to mention on the school district, I was a young teenager at the time, but just my recollection was... You know that it was controversial, but I just should add that uh, my re I think I'm correct on this that Gerald O'Brien, who was a prominent Fitchburg farmer on South Seminole, yeah, I, I think he was the uh, chairman of the committee that you know, I don't know what the title of it was, but uh, like the resistance to the consolidation consolidation committee, I believe. So oh, to consolidate was, or against it? No, the school the official committee in charge of oh uh, of executing the consolidation oh wow i'm quite sure of that wow so there was a rural involvement it wasn't just and i should add even though i lived on a farm on cross country road we were in the small one of the rural areas that was you know attended the verona graded school so yeah. i wasn't one of the rural school kids but but there was rural you know, input, of course, but I'm pretty sure Gerald O'Brien was the chairman of the, of the committee to uh, uh, carry out the consolidation. So you were a farm kid 
who went to the centralized school district. You right. were if you that. Look at the map. There's an there's an area that goes up to Highway PD north of Verona that was part of the graded school district, and then in the south, that portion. You see, it says Verona grades. Yeah. Yep. Oh, and there's the village yeah, right here. Yep. But then where it says Verona grades on the bottom, that was way before my time, but I believe that was the Brown School mm -hmm. uh, District. I don't, um, there was a Brown family on um, Sunset Drive. Um, the Brown School burned down at some point. And as I understood it, rather than rebuilding the school, then they consolidated into the Verona Graded School District. Yeah. So that's why there's a split uh, area there. I yeah, the I've original part included the village and then a little bit of rural area. I, I've read the same thing about that that Brown School District as well. And when I drive by there going to the dog park, there's a there's a lot there where that was. I'm like, man, I need to meet that person at some point and go digging around and see what's still there. Because, heck, maybe there's a foundation or something, you know? It'd be pretty cool. Well, thanks. And, Ken, just so you know, your 1972 book is The Gift That Keeps Giving. I referenced it over and over for this presentation, as I do all the time. So um, it's one of those timeless gifts that you've given to, to future generations. You, oh, Carl, and Alice. Yeah. How that happened was at the time of the Quasco Centennial, I worked um, out of high school and for a while for Henry Schrader at the Verona Press. And Henry agreed to take on this project of updating the history book. And somehow I got sucked into that <laughs> and ended up kind of holding the bag and, and basically just did it. <laughs> it wasn't really anything I volunteered for originally, but I said I would help and kind of uh, ended up uh, doing it. Where I, where I work, that's called voluntold. <laughs> yeah, that's where you... kind of how that happened. I had just come back from uh, basic training for the National Guard, and uh, he said, hey, would you help out with this project? And, okay, so that's well, all that came about. I know you did. You presented your book to our group before I joined because I've seen the video. If you're ever up for doing that again, I'd love to have you come back and do that at some point. But I will, I will bug you about that because okay. I love that All book. Right. Well, thank you. And a side note about the Nine Mounds, Phil Salkin and the State Historical Society filled out a report in 2010, but that's kept confidential because it was on private land. So one of my long-term goals is to get Epic's permission to see the report so we can learn, like, did they ground penetrate radar? Did they... How did they? How did they find this area and know where it was so so specifically? But luckily, I know someone who works at Epic, so maybe that will be a project for another day. <laughs> um, cool. Well, thanks everybody. Let me just check. We have a few more messages come in. Um, I ooh, here we go. Let's see. I'm a fairly new resident of Verona. I thought the house along Highway M on the east side of the road near Raymond Road would have been on the list. Is that house in Madison? So I think you mean. Yes, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. So you're heading out on Highway M, and it's on your, it's on the northeast corner of PD and and Highway M. And actually, let me see if I can pull this off. Technology. I'm going to pull up the browser, and I'm going to show you exactly what you're talking about. That. I'm going to go to our website. And by the way, welcome to town. Welcome to town, Dorothy. It's great to have you here. And, and especially, I mean, it's amazing you have this early interest in your town's history. I think that's a very cool thing. Uh, VeronaHistory.com. The house you're talking about, if we go, here we go. Um, there's a lot of names for it, but I kind of informally call it the Little Farmhouse on MMPD. I think this is the one you're referring to that was recently repainted. And, oh, looks like I can't get my document up here. But if you click on this website, you can watch. We did a little tour of it three summers ago where we went through there and we um, presented a lot of history. So if you want to learn more about it. But you, you've got a great point. That would be a good top ten list because I think we had a Civil War veteran in there. I think we had uh, maybe a World War. Well, we definitely had a World War One veteran there, Oli Thompson. And also, too, that that house has a outhouse behind it, a windmill an old barn, an old shed. It's it's like a little snow globe of r rural life lost, if you will. It's when you drive by it, look, you see all those things. So that's a great point. It fits under that that criteria of a lost era. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. That's definitely a really important house in place. Cool. Let me see if there's any other comments. Okay. 
Oh, okay. So someone asked uh, for a little more clarification on the site of the Badger Mill. And I know I did kind of blow through that quickly. And also, too, I talk too fast. I'm aware of this. The good thing about the recording is I can, I'll can i slow it down 20%. So when you watch us on YouTube, <laughs> you'll be able to understand what I said. Ruth is cheering. Yeah, sorry about that, y'all. So here, <laughs> So here is the Badger Mill. Just to give you the high level, if you head south, here's our main intersection. Where's my little clicker? If you head south, you go down Main Street, you go by Carnes on your right, and you come down to where Badger Mill Creek goes underneath. So here's the main intersection by Walgreens and the bank and the gas station. Here's the old map, uh, oldest map, but not super easy to read. This area here is where the creek used to go across and there's where the mill was according to this, this author. And let me show you that when you're coming down, so this is Carnes in this area. As you come down, today you go kind of, well, I shouldn't say straight, but you curve. But back then there was a huge gooseneck here and we they straightened out this road. And let me show you the modern picture. You can see what's there today. So today, as you come by Carnes and you come across Badger Creek, which is now further north than it was historically, to the south of that, just before Locust, this is roughly where the plat map puts it. And again, it was it was up to the discretion of the map maker on how accurate they were here. But this one seems pretty darn accurate. It's right in the corner of two things. And today this would be on the northwest corner of this family's house that you drive by. And currently there's a lot of equipment here ripping stuff up. Another bummer, but according to the map, it would be around here. And I just, I've been through there. I actually know this family. I, I went to school with one of their with their children and I've walked all around here. There's even before the ripping up of this year, there's no foundations down there. There's a cool old barn foundation on this side, which is more modern that you can still see and, and you can uh, you can reach down and touch. But as far as a mill, it doesn't look like it's there. Uh, does that help? Um, can we see the white? Uh, okay, question. Can we see the white school from the road? If you're not the driver, you can. Don't don't try to look for it while you're driving because you'll 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 plow over a deer. But if you if you're heading west. Look to your right, and right before, oh, this Timber is a, Lane. Timber Lane, thank you, yep. Timber Lane. Watch this, I'm going to, um, technology again, Google Maps. Um, I'm going to show it to you. Uh, right let's on see. the corner of Timber Lane. Oh, cool, thanks Lisa, I forget the name of that. I know White Crossing is there, but I forget. So, I used to live on Timber Lane, that's why. Oh, you did, oh, awesome, so you know it pretty well. Let me zoom out yeah. a little bit. Uh oh, wait, where did I end up? Oh, here we go. I got to go a little bit more north. Where's PD? Sorry, getting disoriented. Here we go. So here is PD. As you go past Timberlane, I'm going to drop the little Street View guy. Man, this is amazing. Wouldn't you like to have this when you're writing your book, Ken? Like this kind of technology to <laughs> just zip around town and uh, look at anyone. So as we go by, right now you'll see it. This, these bushes and trees are, are the leaves are gone. As we go here. It's behind this, so during summer, hard to see, but it's not usually this overgrown. There it is, as I, you can see it on this corner. If you turn north on Timber Lane, you get a really good shot of it. Well, in the winter, it's right behind here. Um, it is private property, so before you go snooping around, you probably want to get permission of the Goodman Jewish uh, Center. Just look from the road, uh, but it's, it's amazing. It looks just like it does in the old pictures. So thank you for asking. Um, I'm, I appreciate the question. You can see it from the road. Yeah. And also, good news, if you want to see it up close, we're going to do a spring cleanup day there. And if you want to volunteer to come with me and, and, and chop down more weeds from the side of it and, and remove brush, you can be part of that group. I'll put it on our website. And then you can go and you can see it and you can touch it and stuff. I'll be getting their permission to do that. So just keep that in mind. But. Yeah, thanks everybody. I think, oh, I went over my time, but that's what I do. I talk fast and I still go over time. Can you imagine if I talked slow enough for you to understand me, we'd be here for four hours. Now I want to transition.